everyone, it's Dr. Tamara Beckford with Your Caring Docs. That's right, where we're helping our busy professional women put their health and wellness first for at least two hours a month. Why? <laughs> because there's 730 hours in the month you can dedicate two to yourself. But we also have our wonderful podcast, Your Caring Docs, Docs Who Cares, where we have doctors from all over the world. They stop by here, leave their health and wellness wisdom, aka gems, right? Biggest part is that they leave their info so you can get in contact with them if you'd like to be a patient or a client of theirs. Today, I got like a special doc out here and I'm about to bring him in in your caring doc's fashion. I'm super excited about our interview today, all right? So this doc, is a graduate from Indiana University School of Medicine, right? And he did his residency in general surgery at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. But as most of my docs, I got a super doc because he didn't stop there, right? He did a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at the Ohio State University because I know I can't just be out there all y'all the Ohio State University fans. I don't want y'all getting upset if I just said Ohio State University. So we had to say the Ohio State University. And this doc is not only a cardiothoracic surgeon, but he is a decorated U.S. Navy veteran, right? So I'm bringing you the one and only one of the top cardiothoracic surgeons in the Pacific Northwest, representing from our Portland, Oregon, this is Dr. Stephen Noble. Thank you. Thank you. I love the energy. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for stopping by. I mean, you've done so much. And so, you know, we're going to pull it off from you as best as we can in this short period of time that we have here with you. So Dr. Noble, tell us, where did this love for medicine come from? How did you get in there? So the love for medicine actually came from uh, just being at my grandparents' house. They, I remember in Portland, Oregon, here in Portland, they uh, had an encyclopedia that I would just love to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an encyclopedia Britannica. And so I'd go over to my grandparents' house and God bless them because they're no longer with this. And every time I, I, I tell the story about how I got into medicine, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my grandparents and my ancestors because they really put me on that path. And so I would go over to their house and I would look at the encyclopedia and I would just flip the, uh, the pages over and over looking at the different organ systems, the skeletal system, then the vascular system, then the, the heart and lungs. And so it, I would just be fascinated with that for hours. And it really sparked an interest into why did things happen? Why did people get right. sick? Why did people die? Why did people get old? Why did people go to the hospital and then not come back? Or if they did come back, they may have came back a little bit different. So mm -hmm. it was really that passion for understanding the human body, looking at the pictures. And I told my family that I wanted to be a physician because it was what kind of sparked that interest as to answering some of those questions. And after doing that, my, my family just really kind of put me on that path as far as pursuing medicine. I read the book Gifted Hands, which inspired me to pursue medicine. <laughs> and that really led to uh, me going to Xavier University of Louisiana. And so right, at the time, people, come on, give oh, them a shout out. XU, XU. Hello. <laughs> so a 1925 society. So it was at the time, Different World was a was a TV show that was out, and yeah. I really wanted that HBCU experience, and that by far was one of the greatest decisions that I made, going to Xavier University, meeting some of the people that I met there, and really having that experience of truly positive peer influences, individuals that really push you to greater heights, and mm -hmm. joined a great organization, Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Beta Tau chapter. Shout out so, to Go ahead. Yes, yes, Beta Tau. So yes. my brother's of Alpha Phi Alpha, and so that really kind of put me on a path to really uh, pursue that dream and that passion of becoming a physician. And, and thankfully, uh, I was able to go to Indiana University and, as you mentioned, go on uh, to Oregon Health Science University. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. I love it that the spark started really with a book with pictures, you know, yes, and then it's simple. like, well, the pictures sparked that interest. It's like, well, how does this work? And then you start looking around your environment and you're looking and you're seeing people, you're seeing people who are being ill, you know, they go to the hospital. Sometimes you'll hear stories like, yeah, this person went in and they never came out. And you're like, 
well, why, right? And then the interest even sparked even more. You might see someone went in and then they came up, but they look different. And it's just like, well, why are they different? So as this young individual, this young man, you know, all of this curiosity sparked. And then your, your family saw it in you. And I love the fact that they, you know, helped to nurture and to bring that and got you to all the different places you know, such as a great institution, um, undergrad that helped to foster and to get you to that level to achieve this dream of becoming a doctor. So now, you know, we got into medicine, but then you went further. Because like I said, you know, you're in the ordinary doc. <laughs> you're just <laughs> like, all right, I'm going into surgery. And then after that, you're like, I'm going into cardiothoracic surgery. So where did those interests come from? So I've always been an individual that liked, uh, you know, playing with my hands. And so very technical. I, I liked playing video games. I liked just working with my hands. So you got that good I'm, hand eye coordination, not like some of us. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so that was just, just something natural. And when I look at my grandparents, uh, my grandfather was, one of my grandfathers was an electrician and ah. another grandfather was a plumber. And so I like to joke that. Oh, I'm, so you had exactly. surgeons already. <laughs> Right, right. And so I like to say that I'm an electrician or a plumber for the for the body. Yeah. And so that sort of tactile sensation, working with my hands, playing with Legos, playing with puzzles, was just something that was natural. So when I went to medical school, one of my first rotations was neurology. But instead of rotating with the neurologist, we got to rotate with the neurosurgeons. Ooh. And I just loved being in the operating room. I loved washing my hands. I loved scrubbing. I loved going to the sink. And then I loved actually working with my hands. So it was really that notion of working with my hands, being able to see people get better immediately mm -hmm. was something that really sparked that interest. And I recall getting ready to scrub into a, a surgery with a transplant fellow mm -hmm. who a transplant fellow is just someone who was doing more additional training in the transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. And so he asked, what was I thinking about going into? And I told him, well, you know, I'm kind of leaning towards surgery. And then he said, well, you're not going to go into surgery. You either know it or you don't. And at that moment, I made the commitment because he said, I'm not going into surgery. I'm going into surgery. Right. And I initially thought that I was going to do trauma surgery as I really enjoyed uh, what those individuals did, they would come in with gunshot wounds or, or motor vehicle crashes, and then they would be taken to the operating room and, and do surgery. And so I really thought that I was going to go into trauma. But when I got into at when I got to OHSU, mm -hmm. I listened to a speech in which or, or grand rounds talk in which the, uh, the the fellow, the cardiothoracic surgery fellow talked about uh, cardio, cardiac surgery is more than just four operations. And that mm -hmm. really sparked an interest of what, what is that all about? What is cardiac surgery all about? Right. And my first rotation as a second year was at the Portland VA Medical Center. And I got to interact uh, with individuals who were undergoing open heart surgery. I got to work, uh, you know, help operate uh, in the, go, be in the operating room and really do this technically uh, uh, complicated surgery. Right. But the way the individuals did it, they, they made it seem very easy. The patients would wake up, they'd have this incision. And then, you know, five days later, they're, they're leaving the hospital feeling great about what had happened. And so I was really fascinated by seeing the heart get put to sleep and then seeing the heart reanimate. And so yeah. that was just amazing to see the uh, a beating heart, uh, putting ice on the heart, seeing the heart just stand still, do the operation and then wake the heart back up. And uh, it, to, to be able to see something completely stop and then reanimate it was something that fascinated me. That was and so right vital. Then and there. You know what I mean? It's like a vital organ. Like, this is like, oh. <laughs> I, correct. Yeah, my mom was blown when I saw that. And so when I saw that, I was like, this, this is what I had, had to do. And so I just fell in love with cardiac surgery right then and there. And that, uh, you know, I, I've never looked back as far as going into CT surgery. Love it, love it, love it. And you know, it's so interesting, because right here behind you, there is a book <laughs> that I would love if you can bring it out to our audience, we will go over it. Yeah, so this is so not only do we have a cardiothoracic extraordinaire, you know, but we also have an author. You are an author. So let us know this book. Where did the inspiration come from? The heart of the hero. It kind of goes along with what you're talking about right now. Thank you. So the heart of the hero, the story of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams is a children's book that really features and chronicles the life of yeah, uh, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Children's book written by whom? R written by myself. Written by thank, you so much. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
but it was a it was a children's book that I wrote uh, that was was uh, in large part inspired by a hero of mine. So Dr. Daniel Hale Williams was uh, an individual that had the first successful open heart surgery. Uh, he did this uh, in the 1800s uh, in 1893, and and at the time. Uh, individuals felt that you just couldn't operate on the heart. And this was a, a black man who really, beyond just performing this, this critical open heart surgery, he also established the first interracial hospital. And so this children's book was an attempt to really uh, honor his life and to do the same thing that those books that I had talked about before did for me, inspire young black kids to, to consider uh, going into the field of medicine, but more importantly, just follow their dreams. And Absolutely. so this, it's a story of a, of a young man who faced adversity in his life. His father passed away when he was 10. Uh, he followed in his father's footsteps of becoming a barber. And when, he, as a barber, he came across a, a, a man, a white man that actually changed his life forever, uh, who inspired him to become a physician. And so he went on to medical school, but after medical school and being in practice, he saw that there were atrocities, really healthcare disparities at the time. Blacks couldn't be treated in hospitals. And so he felt that there had to be a better way uh, of really delivering care. And so what he decided to do was to establish the first interracial hospital uh, at the time and created the first sort of training program for black nurses. And so he had created this hospital that had black, black physicians, white physicians, and, and black nurses and, and really created Providence Hospital uh, in, in Chicago. And, and that really uh, was one of the first times that you saw individuals really address healthcare disparity. And, and it really highlights the, the meaning of sponsorship, working uh, with other people that don't look like you, right. and really uh, as a community coming together and addressing healthcare disparities. And he had a great saying that uh, those who don't take care of their, uh, uh, a civilization that does not take care of their sick and suffering are not worthy of civilization. Mm -hmm. And so he really made it a mission to really help those that were less fortunate. And because of that, I felt it was just really uh, impactful and powerful to really speak about his life and, and to really present his life in such a way that young kids would, would be able to uh, be inspired to, to, to pursue their own dreams. I love it. I love it. You know, one of the interesting aspects of this book is that he is inspired by someone who believed in him, right? And mm -hmm. his inspiration came from a barber. So it's not that his inspiration came from another doctor. So now when we're talking about that, there's also this additional thing, you know, so Dr. Noble, I'm just going to call him the Renaissance Dr. Noble man, right? Who is here. So not only is he an author, but there's also an additional aspect of your life that I would love us to highlight, helping with healthcare disparity. And, you know, we talked about, um, the barber being one of the inspirations for this book. We also now have this wonderful organization that you're a part of, which is called Life Chair, right? And with Life Chair, we are trying to help healthcare disparities using our barbers and our salons. So tell us a little bit about Life Chair and how it's really going to make this impact on us and with healthcare disparity there. Yeah. Great. So Live Chair Health is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's a uh, healthcare startup company that really looks to address healthcare disparities by leveraging those places of trust that we have in the Black community, uh, mm -hmm. barbershops, hair salons, and churches. And although this approach isn't new, some of the early studies of using barbershops and, and salons in this sort of form of fashion to deliver care where people mm -hmm. are really started in the in the 60s and the 70s. But if we, if we go back and think about you know, arguably we could say it started in the 1890s when with the first development of the first black uh, life insurance company, uh, North Carolina uh, uh, Mutual Life Insurance Company, which had its origins uh, in the barbershop. So the barbershop owner, you know, and all the other individuals came to the shop and, and thought, you know, we really need to create our own uh, uh, life insurance company. And that was the first a uh, black owned life insurance company, one of the largest in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so what Live Chair Health does is kind of build upon those lessons and those principles mm -hmm. of delivering care to where people are by using uh, technology to innovate this sort of design. So when people come into the shop, we address uh, one of the first things, healthcare access. Do they have health insurance? If they don't have health insurance, we work with uh, uh, we work with them to, to, to get them health insurance. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they have a health care provider, we work with them to, to, to get a health care provider. So what Live Chair Health does is bring some of the stakeholders of health care delivery together, mm -hmm. provider networks, uh, payers, uh, insurance companies, 
the, the patients and the community. And by bringing these four groups of stakeholders together, we try to address healthcare disparities by doing things at the barbershop, at the salons, at churches, doing a biometric screening, getting your blood pressure taking, mm-hmm. having, you, having individuals fill out a health risk assessment to try to tease out those social determinants of health and figuring out how can we best help individuals address those social determinants of health. And then again, working with the payers as far as how do we help individuals with healthcare access and using technology, being able to log your vitals into this app, being able to provide content that people can use, that people can educate themselves about their disease, uh, to be able to log their medications, their, their, their food, and then read, again, articles to help them get a better understanding. We're hoping to address a lot of these disparities these disparities that we know all too often as far as higher rates of diabetes, more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, more like, likely to die in contract um, uh, situations of like lung cancer and die from, from lung cancer. So mm-hmm. Live to Your Health is really an attempt to, to reimagine healthcare delivery and delivering care to where people are. Love it, love it. Now, I know some of you are listening and you're like, well, why are we talking about this? Like, you know, what is so important about Live Chair and you know, well, busy professional women, I'm pretty sure one of the things that you need is self-care. Now, a lot of times when we think about self-care, a lot of busy professional women are thinking about going to get their hair done, which is a part of self-care. But the other part of self-care is the health. So with Life Cheer, Life Cheer is merging those two together, right? So you're getting your health and your self-care around in the same area, right? So now when you have penciled in to go and get your hair done, you can also now say that you've penciled in to go and get at least that basic checkup, right? Because you have done so and you've saved your time, right? You've done it there. So you have that access to the care. And that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this. Because I know that healthcare is important and I know it's important to you, but a lot of times we forget that healthcare is part of self care, right? So that's why we're talking about this. And that's why I want you guys to know that this is out there to help with your self care and your health care. All right. So, you know, I done pulled all of this out of Dr. Noble. I was going to all talk about like robotic surgery and all this other stuff. So I might just ask him because like I said, this extraordinary physician, cardiothoracic surgeon, you know, our Navy veteran, decorated Navy veteran and author, and also one of the staple members of the live chair, he is doing robotic surgery. And I know you're thinking like, okay, so you're working on all these vital organs and what robots, where did the robots come in? So let's explain to those who are listening what robotic surgery is and how it's used as part of the surgical care. (laughs) Well, so robotic surgery or robotic assisted surgery is really just a treatment modality. So what we do is we use um, a a robot. Basically, we, uh, this robot is something that is controlled by the surgeon, by myself. Mm -hmm. And what it does is help us um, in in a very minimally invasive way Mm -hmm. to be able to remove uh, tumors. Uh, I typically like to use the robotic uh, platform or device uh, to remove uh, someone's lung or lung cancer or a portion of of someone's chest, maybe the thymus. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we create small incisions in the chest, uh, thereby being able to put instruments inside the person's chest. Mm -hmm. And then we connect this robotic device that that is able to give us more manipulation or more movement than what our arms can do. And Mm -hmm. then I'll be able to sit at the console or basically sit about six feet or 10 feet away from the actual device. So I'm not at right at the patient's bedside. I'm actually sitting uh, at a chair, uh, putting my, my head inside the the hood or the console. And and when I put my head inside the console, I'm able to see inside the body in 3D. Mm -hmm. I'm able to control and manipulate the arms of the robot. And although uh, my hand can move in so many different directions, the robotic arms can move in way more uh, sort of uh, different directions than, than our hands can. And the other thing that it does is it, it, it prevents any sort of shaking or tremors or anything of that nature. So long story short, we're able to perform very technically, uh, you know, very highly technical operations mm-hmm. in a very safe and efficient way. And, and the hope is that uh, maybe one day, 25 years from now, we can have this sort of device, this 
this robotic device in a remote location, whereas a surgeon is not even at the bedside, but perhaps uh, several miles away. And so it really is a tool that we like to use. And, and, and it's a great tool to really help patients have their lungs removed or have, uh, have surgery performed mm -hmm. in a way that allows them to get back to their normal activities in a quicker right. fashion with, with less pain, quicker recovery, and yeah. a, a less time in the hospital. So some patients can go home as early as one to two days after having their lungs removed, whereas wow. before it may have been three to five days with an incision about that big or maybe yes. you know, a 10 inch incision. We're, big, we're able to do this incision with very small incisions, less use of pain medicines, and and quicker return to recovery and quicker return to work, which is very right. important because if you cannot work, uh, it's very hard for people to, to, to uh, provide for themselves. So for themselves. It, it really is a great tool. Absolutely. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, you know, the thing that's so interesting is the manipulations using the hand. And if we really sit and think about the function of our hands, we do have, you know, we have the planes, the different planes, but with when, when I say planes, I'm talking about we have up and down, left and right, we can twist a little bit, but then with the robot, the robot can do so much more, you know, and the robot, the robot assisted device, I love it, it's kind of an extension of the surgeon's arms themselves, and with the ability to manipulate even further, and to do things within a tighter space. So the surgeon doesn't have to chalk open this entire area just to use, just to get to this smaller space, right? The robot assisted device can do that. And also, did you guys notice that all of these folks who were really good at um, playing video games, and all of a sudden, they're not even more excellent <laughs> because they're using those same skills as a surgeon and using it as a cardiothoracic surgeon. So kudos to all you guys. I was so horrible at Mario Brothers. I'm talking about the original. Yes, Mario always got clamped by the screen. We, you know, I'm talking about the original one with a dun 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 dun, dun. <laughs> Yes. So <laughs> I'm so glad that you were way better at it because you're using all of those skills now and helping so many people. And like I said, Dr. Stephen Noble is bringing his great care of health to all of those who are in the Portland, Oregon area. I mean, you guys are lucky because you have one of the best right there to take care of you. So before I go any further, you know, we've talked about how Dr. Noble is taking care of all of these folks. You know, he did it in the Navy. He did it there, you know, I didn't even talk about it. he was doing it over in California and then he brought it back over to, you know, the North, the Pacific Northwest. He's there in Portland, Oregon. He's taking care of so many others. We want to know what does Dr. Noble do for self-care? You let us know. Self-care. So uh, spending time with family, uh, uh, my wife and kids, uh, playing video games. Uh, so I'm a big now, video look gamer. look at him. He's still practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that good, but I do like to play. So I, I will play, uh, you know, basketball, NBA 2K, uh, mm -hmm. Grand Theft Auto, uh, maybe some uh, Call of Duty. You do a lot of uh, do you like, So those who play the video games, I don't know if you can be as good as playing a video game if you don't do a lot of trash talking. But we're <laughs> extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> my sons are, are, are way better at, the, at that than I am but, uh, but yeah they, they play a lot of video games yes. and uh, I try to exercise as much as possible uh, I don't get to do it as you know as much as I should but uh, th those are the things video games uh, family time um, movies I'm a big movie fanatic and, and and again try to get some exercise in as much as possible Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All righty. So now our question that we have for all of our doctors, anyone who steps on the Your Caring Doc platform, if you weren't a doctor, what would you be? That's a tough question. I, I really didn't have a fallback plan, but I would have to say a lifeguard. Oh, I would have to say we have lots and lots of creative <laughs> doctors who are going to be DJs. We have doctors who are going to be travel um, journalists. We have lots of doctors who are doing so many creative things. So no, my, my, yeah, my fallback plan would have been a, a lifeguard. Uh, that was I was a lifeguard. Uh, my brother and I were lifeguards in high school. And that yeah. was just, uh, you know, I enjoy swimming mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, rescuing uh, little kids out of the pool was just something that <laughs> that, that came with the territory. Love so uh, if I could be a professional lifeguard, that that, that was my fallback plan. You uh, know what? Yeah. I always love that most of the the um, 
answer to this question. So people are still saving <laughs> lives <laughs> in whatever it is that they do. So with a professional life card, he's out there saving lives, but he's doing that in a different manner as a cardiothoracic surgeon. I love it, love it, love it. So Dr. Noble, please let us know, those who are listening and want to get in contact with you, let us know where can we find you. And of course, let them also know about this lovely book that you wrote. <laughs> Great. So they can find me on Twitter at Dr. Steve, D-R-S-T-E-V-E-M-D. So Dr. Steve, M-D. You can also uh, follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Stephen L. Noble on LinkedIn. And then uh, you can check out Live Chair at www.livechair, L-I-V-E-C-H-A-I-R.co. And then the book, The Heart of the Hero, uh, the story of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams is on Amazon. So just uh, type in The Heart of the Hero at Amazon and you'll be able to get the book. And uh, please uh, make, make sure you, you check out a book and, uh, you know, get five and, and give one to the kids. And so yes, it's really and for, for any and everyone, but it's for the kids. Coming. Hello, hello, hello. Holiday season is coming. This will be a great gift for those in the holidays. All righty, Dr. Noble, thank you so much for stopping by, you know. You. This was great. This was wonderful. So this wonderful podcast episode will be available on our Your Caring Docs podcast. That's Your Caring Docs, Docs Who Cares. And I would be remiss if I did not let you guys know that we are in the month of October at this point. And our Your Caring Docs, we have our first live summit. Yes, it's a free virtual summit that will be held on October the 25th through the 28th. It is our Empower and Inform Women's Cancer Summit, right? So we have doctors from all over the world. So I'm going to give you a little bit. So we have this free summit on the 25th, 26th, 27th. We have doctors, Lorna Rodriguez, who is our gynecologist oncologist coming out of California. She's going to go over ovarian cancer and why it's so challenging to find, right? And then we have Dr. Minoko Abi that's coming from Tokyo, Japan, and her interview is wonderful, wonderful. She's going to be going over immunotherapy. We have Dr. Mitra Ayazafar in California. She is our ovarian cancer survivor when the physician becomes the patient. Wonderful, wonderful story. And then live on the 28th, we have one of our top docs that's coming from the top cancer institute here in Houston, Texas. Her name is Dr. Abina Brewster. She's going to be going over breast cancer. She's a top researcher, endocrinologist, and a medical oncologist oncologist. You do not want to miss any of that. And we're going to have some great surprises on some survivors who will be there, right? So sign up at www.yourcaringdocs.com. That's U-R-C-A-R-I-N-G-D-O-C-S.com. We'd love to see you there. We're going to thank Dr. Stephen Nova for Thanks stopping so by this wonderful, wonderful interview. I know you guys learned a lot. So you learned about cardiothoracic surgery, robotic surgery. You learned about this wonderful book. And we also learned about life chair. So you guys, like we said, the heart of the hero, we have the holiday season coming. This will be a great gift for you to give to your loved ones, kids and the kids' kids and the cousins and their cousins' cousins, all right? So don't forget to go out there and get one. Thank you all for listening and take care. Bye-bye.